Today, we're sharing an inspiring story of how one man went from serving over two decades in prison to now having redemption. So you're gonna wanna have some tissue handy. Most, most poor black people end up in the system because of that. Because of the lack of representation and because of the skin color. No father wants to see his son go to jail. It was unconstitutional to give a juvenile a mandatory life sentence. This story will change your entire outlook on life. Don't tell me what God can't do, man. I was charged with um, first degree murder and, and found guilty of second degree murder. And that's what brought me here, 10 gold. I come from the city of New Orleans and I grew up in a very violent neighborhood and where most of my friends died before the age of 18. And, and basically I know that I escaped death through all of that, you know. I know if, if I wouldn't have came here, I'd be dead in hell somewhere. Basically, out there, I had no peace, you know, and I always was wondering when I was gonna be next to be killed, you know, and it got to a point to where I really just accepted it. You know, hey, you know, I guess this is what it's supposed to be for me, you know. Now, before we hop into today's show, I want to remind you of the book of the month, Goals by Zig Ziglar. Be sure to get your copy linked in the description box below. And while you're there, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so you can be notified every single time we drop a new video. Alrighty now, let's hop into the show. Welcome to the table. Yeah, yeah. We gonna get real. We gonna get right. Oh, building up wealth. We gonna get life. Welcome to the table. Man, today's show, you guys, is probably going to be one of the most... I'm trying to think of the proper word to describe today's show. I, I, I don't have the most... Pro I don't have a proper word to describe it. It's going to be heartfelt. It's going to be meaningful. I believe it's going to inspire um, a lot of us. I, I would encourage you, if you have a young man, um, if you have a young man... Um, you need to share this show. As a matter of fact, I would probably even say pause it and go get your son and get your daughter right now. Go get your boyfriend right now. Um, I would definitely say if your son is not around, man, rewatch this with your son, young man. If you're a husband, if you're a father, you want to watch this show with your kid. Um, <clears throat> a couple of months ago, I was contacted by um, a publisher and it said, hey, man, uh, this young man doesn't have a huge following, but he has a huge story that deserves a huge stage. And we think it'll be a perfect fit for your community and audience. And when I was researching and talking with my team about it, um, I, I immediately sent it to Michelle, who pretty much leads um, all of our guests. And she said, no, this would be a great, great, great story. And I just spent some time with him and Michelle just spent some time with him talking about more of his story and more of his journey. And I don't really have set questions I want to ask. I just want to give this man the opportunity to share his testimony, to share his story, because I think a lot of us make mistakes and a lot of us are defined by our mistakes. But the only person who can define us is God. Our mistakes from our past don't define us, uh, but God can use all things for his glory and today man i'm super excited because we have yeah. ronnie on the show and uh ronnie served 27 years in prison and today he's impacting the world in a tremendous way with his story with his testimony and his journey so ladies and gentlemen let's welcome to the table for the first time and definitely not the last time the next time we got to get him here in person is my dear friend ronnie what's going on ronnie Hey man, I'm blessed. I'm blessed, man. Very grateful to be here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, man. I, I'm. I'm. I want to say thank you uh, for creating this time for you to come on and to share your story, share your testimony um, of what you've been through. You guys, uh, Ronnie is the author of a new book called Twenty Seven Summers, and we're going to put the link of his book 
um, in today's show notes. Uh, but I really want to just straight up dive into uh, the book. It's 27 Summers, One Man's Journey from the Streets to a Life Sentence in Prison to Freedom in Christ. And you guys know how we roll over here. We are the E3 community, and we're talking about expanding in three main areas in the year 2024, abundance, wellness, and what? Freedom. And this man's book is talking about, hey, how he went from the streets to prison. Clearly, he didn't serve life because he's on with us right now to now freedom in Christ. Right now, I want to start off and just talk about, I want to go straight in. I, I, I want to go straight into your story and your journey. Uh, this book is a memoir of your life. Yeah, and I'm going to go back to the very, very beginning. Because how, how old are you now, Ronnie, if you mind me asking? I'm 48. 48. 48 years old, man. Yeah. Um, eight years, nine years older than me. And I was reading over your notes, and, and it showed uh, that your first time you saw someone killed in front of you, you were 12 years old. Talk to us a little bit about yeah. your childhood and what you grew up in. And then we'll yeah. go from there. And so I grew up in a very, um, in New Orleans, Louisiana, um, a very poverty stricken area. Um, and I can remember um, growing up, you know, there was always some type of altercation going on in the streets. Um, but I think it really got worse in the late 1980s. Um, I can remember when I moved from one area, we moved from the seven ward, New Orleans is separated in different wards to the eight ward and very nice neighborhood. Um, I can remember being on a porch feeding the birds and something happened in the late 1980s on um, the crack epidemic completely mm. destroyed our neighborhood. Um, and so with a lot of drug, with drugs, follows it there's a lot of violence and so um it was very common for me to hear gunshots and to hear sirens now i was very accustomed to that um in fact that became normal to me until i can remember when i was a time when i went on um, by my dad in florida and i didn't hear that i felt uncomfortable because i didn't hear that mm. and so um the abnormal became normal to me and so here it is, this, this crack epidemic and this violence taking place. And um, also during that, that, that period, um, my dad was making a transition from, from Jacksonville, Florida, to, from, from New Orleans to Jacksonville, Florida. And um, I, was, I was very, I was very um, disappointed in that. Um, he, he left, um, of course, this, this, this teenager trying to wrap his mind around his dad leaving. Yeah. Uh, I come from a neighborhood. I got friends where they don't even have dad. Wow. And so now it's like, okay, this how they feel, <laughs> you know? And so my dad and I was very close. He was everything to me. And now he's leaving. And, and I can see now for some good reason, I understand now, but I couldn't understand that then. I was very angry, I was upset, and um, I was hurt. I felt abandoned. And and so just during a period of time where I really needed a man to navigate me through what was happening in my neighborhood and really help me. And so there was none there. And and so the streets began to fall to me. Mm. Um, the, drug, the drug dealers, um, I began to look up to her and aspire to, okay, that's what I want to be. You know, I saw the cars, the rims, the the sound in the cars, the gold gold chains, the gold teeth, and the females that, that kind of flock to them. I said, okay, that's what I want to be. And so um, before you know it, um, start selling drugs, me and a couple of my friends, and um, was doing all sorts of things um, with the street offers. And consequently, that led me into into um, jail for um, for murder at the age of sixteen. And so I, I get into an altercation with a guy, and um, me and a couple of my friends jump him. And the next time he sees me, um, it's Christmas Day on Canal Street, very busy area in downtown New Orleans, and we're pretty much outnumbered. Um, it's like two or three of us and there's about six or seven of them and so they saw our opportunity there and i always carried a gun everywhere i went 
and one of the guys who we had the altercation with, um, he knew that. And so one thing led to another, um, shots fired, um, two people ended up in a pool of blood and I'm standing over them with a gun. Um, um, and so, uh, a 14 year old had, had died and also, um, 18 year old, he had, he survived. Um, the one who I actually had the altercation with. And so that leads me into the the juvenile B roll, um, which I was I had been there two or three times, you know, and prior to that and my mother come sign me out and I I was waiting on my mom to come sign me out. She couldn't sign me out of that. And so um after a few court appearances in the juvenile court they they decided on um, to charge me as an adult. Mm. And um, I was transferred to the adult prison and rebooked on charges of first degree murder. Mm. So now I am facing the death penalty, mm. and I'm I'm really blown away. I'm re- really um, I was very optimistic. I'm thinking, okay, you know, yeah, this won't last long. I'll be home soon, and. <laughs> But and everything was like really fun and games to me. Um, wow. Until the trial, until the trial, everything got real. Um, all these legal terms passed around, and here it is: the jury is deliberating. And of course, I had a public. Um, I'm gonna say it. And one of my friends, Pastor Donks, um, his terminology. I had a public pretender. Mm. You know, a, yep. Yeah. Yep. A, yeah. A public. Def- he de- he pretended to defend me, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. And so um, and so here it is um, man um, I'm in the holding tank. I can still hear the um, I can still hear the cell door sh- slam, wow. and the key turn, and I can still hear the the guards' footsteps, you know, fading away. And I'm all along in the holding tank while the jury is deliberating. And so the weight of everything came down on me in that cell. Mm-hmm. And I began to realize, okay, there's 12 people that that don't really know me that's making the decision on whether I live or die. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, man, I, I don't want to die. And so right after that, I began to hear, um, I believe it's, I believe it was God using my mother's voice, and I can I can hear her saying, "Um, baby, if you ever in trouble, that I can't get you out of, you call on Jesus." Mm. Mm. So right there in that cell, I got on my knees. I was I was crying, and and I called out to him, and I had a very simple prayer. A lot of people say, "Oh, you don't make deals with God." I made a deal with him. <laughs> that was my prayer. <laughs> I said, I said, God, I said, Lord, if 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 you don't let them kill me, I promise you, I'll serve you the rest of my life. Wow. And for the first time in my life, I experienced the peace of God. That was a peace that came over me. I didn't know what it was. Then I can look back and, you know, identify with it. But there was this calmness, mm. this 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 inward resolve that resolve that I was gonna be okay. And man, um, and so they come back out. Um, so the jury came out with a guilty verdict of the lesser offense, um, the responsive verdict, which was second degree murder. And it carried a mandatory life sentence without benefits of parole or probation. So in layman's terms, you die in prison, mm-hmm. you know, and so you never get out. And so they sentenced me to that. And so, but I like to tell a story like this, um, while in that holding tank, man, uh, I received two life sentences. You know, uh, the state was giving me a life with no benefits, but God was giving me a life sentence with so many benefits in, it, in his word. He encouraged you not to forget them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so, man, um, so here it is. I'm, I'm on this journey. Um, of, and I was, I was very optimistic then. I still 
felt like, man, soon I'll go home, man. That I'm, and I always had an inner resolve that I was not going to die in prison, even when everybody else around me was dying in prison. Men were growing old, you know. And so I find myself on this pad, on this this long snake road right off of 61 on um, Tunica Hill, um, headed to Angola. It's, it's 20 mile snake road. Mm. And man, um, I'm like, oh, it was a surreal moment. Felt like I was dreaming, but I was thinking about, I can, I never forget on that road. I was thinking about how, you know, um, how Angola is, the stories I heard about them, you know, it was, and it Angola was, it was, was the, up. Angola was the prison that you were going to. Yes. So the penitentiary, Angola, Louisiana, the island, but Angola was the prison. Right. Right, so Louisiana State Penitentiary. Um, it was once a um, it was once a plantation where they where they um where they brought slaves from Angola mm. to that area, and enslaved them, and so they named the area Angola to make them feel like they were at home. Mm. And so and so that's where I'm headed to this um, this big plantation. It's eighteen thousand acres. Yeah. Um surrounded by the Mississippi River um, on either side. And, and so here it is, um, I'm thinking about this, this, this place labeled as the, the bloodiest prison in the nation. You know, it was very violent. And one of the things that they preyed upon was the young. And so here I am, I'm, I'm 18 by this time, head of 10 goal, um, um, Literally, I was, what, 5'11", 131 pounds. Wow. Didn't have a string of hair in my face. Wow. Wasn't even growing hair in my face then. And I'm headed to Angola. And I made a decision on that bus. I said, man, because um, I know they preyed up on the young with raping them and making them be, you know, their little slaves and doing mm. things. So I made a decision on a bus that I'm going in this gate. I'm going in this gate of man and I'm a, I'm gonna come out this gate whether in the box or walking but I'll be a man mm. you know and so um um that was my mindset so I went with that chip on my shoulder you know and and dealing with guys it just just amazingly you know I I used to always at one time I thought because I figured I was so bad and I was stand up guy nobody would go mess with me and all that there but i can look back and see man man god was protecting me man he was <laughs> man listen listen yeah. he he was orchestrating a plan he wow. had a plan that he was putting together that i had no idea yeah what's going on everyone it's your boy ao here and i'm super excited to share some incredible news with you on january 22nd through the 26th we're launching a transformative movement called pray fyi short for Pray for your increase. We're believing 2024 will be the year we eliminate debt and build wealth. So real quick, I wanna give you a sneak peek into what's happening January 22nd through the 26th. I wanna encourage you to join myself and thousands of others in this week of prayer as we're diving into a series of powerful sessions, each focusing on a key aspect of financial well-being. Join this movement by visiting prayfyi.com. You see, day one, we're focusing on debt reduction and financial stress. We'll be praying for wisdom to identify and eliminate unnecessary expenses, making room for your financial growth and stability. On day two, it's all about increase in salaries and business income. We'll come together and pray for guidance in pursuing career opportunities, promotions, and the skills needed to boost our income. Day three is all about increase in wealth and investment opportunities. Let's pray for discernment and wisdom. We need this in making sound financial decisions that lead to long-term, I mean long-term, I mean generational prosperity. On day four, we're tackling boosting multiple streams of income. Together, we'll pray for creativity and opportunities to diversify our income streams, creating financial abundance. And finally, on day five, enhancing legacy. Let's pray for discernment and wisdom in making some sound financial decisions that lead to long-term 
prosperity. I wanna personally invite you to join me on this journey of financial and spiritual growth. Listen, I honestly, I can't wait to see you there. Visit prayfyi.com to get started. I'll see you soon. And so I was, I was placed around some guys, man, who was willing to help me and not hurt me. Wow. I'm talking about some of the greatest men of God, some wow. of the man, most intelligent men, um, man, that you can ever meet was right there waiting on me. You know, <clears throat> I want to, I want to. I want to pause right there because I have like so many notes that I really want to just ask you on because I think your story, I'm trying to just be, uh, I'm trying not to get as emotional because you said something that is, I believe is so true. And I really want to get your thoughts on this now that you're out, now that you're serving God and you're serving people and you're helping people. Um, you said something that, that, that I want to go back to, that your father left you and and he left you for good reasons now that you're older and you understand mm -hmm. why he left. But then you said after that, when your father left you, the streets raised you. Uh, recently, um, if I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I know you, I think you just had a, a, a newborn, right? A three a three year old baby. Is it, is it a son or is it a daughter? I have a son. Um, he's three years old. He'll be four in January. Four, 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 four. So now that you have a son in your life mm -hmm. and congratulations, man. I mean, your story is yeah. just, yeah. it is amazing. Yeah. Why do you think it is important? Because we have a lot of men watching this show right now. And we have mm -hmm. a lot of ladies watching this show as well, single mothers watching this show. And I want to say this respectfully that, that are somewhat blocking their fathers, their sons or daughters' fathers from meeting their life. Let me ask you this question. If your father was still in your life actively, do you think you would have turned out the way that, that you did at that young age? Like, do you think uh, the importance of having a father in someone's life is very important? It's, it's extremely important. And I think, um, I think things would have been different if he was present because he was, he was a real father. Mm. You know, he, he was very intentional and, and his own um, fathering, you know, he wasn't just there. You know, one of the worst things is to have a um a father that's there, but he's absent. Mm. <laughs> you know, that's that's even worse than not even having a have father a there at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and so um when he was on the scene, he was always there, and so it would have it would have definitely um helped me a lot because I'm moving into that young man um stage, and I needed to know how to be a man. Mm. And that's difficult. It's difficult for a woman to teach you that. She's never been a man, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so that would have that would have made a, a great difference. And it's very important. Um, I spend a lot of time. If you look on my social media page, I spend a lot of time with my son, my son, and mm -hmm. I I post things for that and just ministering to people and showing them. Oh man, as a father, you don't have to be perfect. Yeah. But you have to be present. Yeah. You know, and it's so much more. We are um we are accustomed to um thinking if we just take care of our kids, if we just buy them this and buy them that, they're okay. But um what they really need is us rather than things, you know. And man, um and so that's 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 very important. Um very important. What is um, <clears throat> When you think about that that time, when unfortunately you're sitting over these these bodies, I'm curious. At I think you said you was what 18, 17, 18. I was I was 16 at the time of the crime. By the time I get to goal, I was 18. 18. Okay, okay. 16 yeah. at the time of the crime. What was going through your head? I'm curious. Like at that time. Oh. You're seeing these bodies. You're in this altercation. Mm -hmm. When it hit you that this this just went down, mm -hmm. what was going through your head at that time? I'm well, curious. Well, well, at that moment, I felt um, I really felt threatened. I really felt like, man, I did what I I needed to do, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to get away um, mm -hmm. from that that place, and so. Um, it actually happened. They tried to really snatch me off of um, the public bus. I was on the front of the bus. They tried to snatch me. They tore my jacket. I pulled up, wow. and that's where I shot from the 
from the first step of the bus yeah. and then stepped over off the bus and then actually stood over one and emptied the gun. But that one I stood over, he actually lived. Wow. Um, but, um, man, I, um, my, the mindset that I had, um, just growing up in that environment that I had to survive, Yeah. you know, and so it, it placed you in it. Then I had a starter jacket on. A lot of people were getting robbed and killed for starter jackets. I remember the them days, bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so to think that, um, you know, instead of having a rational thought that, okay, just don't wear starter jacket. You know, you think to wear a starter jacket and arm myself in case somebody comes. And so, um, so that's what my mindset was. Um, yeah. When I think about that time, because what year was that? That was 1991. 91. Okay, 91 and 91. So would you say that there were current circumstances that led to the involvement in, in that led to your conviction? Like 16, you committed that crime, but you wasn't right. convicted until 18. Right, to 17. I was convicted at 17. I went to prison at 18. 18. So... They can still charge you as an adult at 17 yeah. years old? Yes. Uh -huh. And so it, it, it starts from the time that you commit the offense. Okay. That's where whatever age it is right there, that's where it starts at. And so they can start all the way up to the age of 15. So a 15-year-old can can actually um go to the penitentiary. What? Um, yes. And so that's what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so it was, um, and so a lot of guys, a lot of kids get into the things and, and very ignorant of the law, Facts. not knowing that this could happen to you, Facts. you know, and I tell a lot of kids when I talk to them, you know, 15, 16, did you, did you know you can go to Angola? They were like, what? No, I can't go to, yes, you could, you know, and so they can charge you as an adult and a lot of times, um, if 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 it's a if it's a white person, they won't charge them as adults. Mm. They charge them as juveniles. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But if you're black and 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 you don't have that type of representation, um um any type of lawyer, you know, to really help navigate you and fight for you, yeah, you um and so most most poor black people end up in the system because of that, you know. Because of the lack of representation and because of the skin color. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, definitely. I 100% agree with that because I've heard mm -hmm. so many people say I had a public pretender, but that mm -hmm. pretender did that defender pretended mm -hmm. to care, but right. didn't care because. Mm -hmm of one skin color and a lack of resources. Right, right. The only time I had even saw my lawyer was at the trial. That's the first time I see him. He never <laughs> never know. came by to even never try came, to fight never came, at all. Never came to see me, never, you know. So every time, and so I, my court date was set back on, um, let me say this, um, every time I went to court, that's the time I saw him. I never had any time with him outside of that. Yo, what's going on fam? Are you ready to make a big career move here by the end of this year? Why not pivot into the flourishing tech industry with the Bethel School of Technology, recognized globally as the sole Christian online tech bootcamp. You see, with African-Americans constituting a mere 7.9% of the U.S. tech workforce, I believe it's time to narrow this display and unlock opportunities for everyone in this thriving sector. Bethel Tech is steadfast in its mission to make tech careers accessible, rewarding, and economically advantageous for all individuals. Their comprehensive nine-month program is designed to equip you with the necessary skills to propel you into your technology career and move forward at a high speed. You see, recent reports from Indeed suggest that software developers in the U.S. command an average annual salary of approximately about $103 thousand dollars this is well above the national average of forty eight thousand dollars you see diversify your tech education by choosing from their specialized programs like cybersecurity and ui ux design with bethel tech 
You're not just kickstarting a career. You're igniting a passion with a purpose. I want you to say goodbye to the prospects of crippling student loan debts and, and instead invest a mere nine months to transform your next decade of your professional journey. Step into your potential with Bethel Tech and turn your career aspirations into reality. To begin, I want you to go to anthonyoneal.com forward slash Bethel or click the link in today's show notes. Again, that is anthonyoneal.com forward slash Bethel. Don't wait another moment to take the first step towards a bright and promising future into a career space that can make you a millionaire. That makes me upset. Yeah. Because if you were white, it would have been a different situation, you think? Yeah, right. Yes, definitely. This is why one of the things I love in your book, you talk about the importance of fathers and the importance mm -hmm. of men stepping up and being fathers because I can only imagine what your life would have been if the father was present because no father wants to see his son go to jail. No father right. is going to sit there and willingly know his son is out there um, actively in these kind of crimes and just sit there. Mm -hmm. I know uh, growing up, I know older men who were out there doing those crimes, <laughs> selling drugs, but will refuse to have their kids in it. You know, right. and so I just want right. to commend you for what you're doing now with your three year old, soon to be four year old son. Yeah. And, and and thank you for that. Um Yeah. I want to I want to I want to sit here and talk about your, your time in prison because mm -hmm. um, you are 17 convicted 18 you're going to Angola one of the 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 prisons that man my god I, I just hope none of my family even has to step into family friends people watching this but when you walk in there at 18 you're greeted gratefully by men who are who want to help you and not hurt you I'm curious though, what was one of the hardest things that you had to endure throughout those 27 years in prison? Oh, I think the hardest thing is, is the mental, is the, is the complete shift of being free to, to being in prison where someone is telling you with everything to do, when to get up, when to go to sleep, when to eat, when to shower, mm. you know, um, and having to deal, I think the real hardest part was being away from family. Mm. You know, and so um, when when you start out in prison, I, I remember a few um, old timers who was there a long time. I said, "Man," and I would always go visit. He said, "He said, Lil, you one guy used to say, Lil, and enjoy that." He said, "Because that stops as years goes on. You don't get as many visits, you know." And so, and so, um, and so you have to deal with the mentality that, uh, um that you're like you're dead to a lot of people, a lot of family, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you don't have that type of support and it's crushing that you're in this place alone. But I think um, to, throughout my period, I still had a lot of great, um, through the 27 years, I had still had some great family support. Um, they still stayed in there with me, especially immediate family. Um, very grateful for that. Um, my, and my dad used to come see me in prison. Wow, which was which was very odd. You when you go into the visiting room, um, it's always females, it's guys, mothers, or girlfriends. It's never men, <clears throat> you know. And so um, that 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 was amazing, you know. And and, it's, and especially to a lot of my friends. You know? Did it? My dad. Did it die though? The longer you got in there, did your family stop coming as frequently, or did it stay consistent? With it your stopped. Family? It it was um it wasn't as frequent, but um I was in a place where in my life where God was really doing some things with me, and I think He was cutting that that cord because I I was. 16 when I got incarcerated. Yeah. And so I depended on them. Right. You know, and so there was periods where, you know, I didn't get any visits, but it was, it, it hurt it, but it was helping me wow. to really depend on God rather than people, Yeah. you know? And so he was cutting that cord and, and, 
and man, God was taking care of me. And so I went to, as I'm going, I'm going, I'm, I'm maturing in Christ and in his grace and in, in his knowledge. I'm getting closer to him and learning to depend on him. And so it, it was a great experience. I, it was, it was painful, but it was great, you know, um, things like that. Um, you can either get, it's only the two charts. You can get better or bitter, mm. you know, and I, I chose to be better. Yeah. You know, I'm, so, <clears throat> I'm curious, curious, Ronnie. Um, you know, we, we talk about money here, right? Like how to make more money, how to be a good student of your money. What, what, in prison at 16, and you got out, what, at uh, 40, 42, 43? 43. 43. 43. Between those years, let's let's talk about money. What did you learn about? Did you learn anything about money inside of prison? Like, did, did you yeah. work? Did you, how did you, I mean, we hear stories. You're selling <laughs> cigarettes. You're selling cheeseburgers. You know, what's, what's real inside of Angola? Like, well, how are y'all transitioning money? How are you making money? You know, what's that? What, what does that look like? And so when you first enter the system, um, the first job you can get, you start at, is in the field. You're in the field line um, with guards on a horse over you, gun guards, and it's basically slavery, the same picture. You're in the field, you're picking different vegetables, you're hoeing, you um, you know, cutting grass or whatever they have on the farm for you. But you're you're the the most you can make um there is four cents an hour four cents an hour four cents an hour and so um that's that was the makeup of it what and so um it it was it was literally um slavery you know um you just made a transition. So the 13th Amendment, it speaks to this. <laughs> you know, here he is, in effect, says that um, there's no more longer slavery except you be in prison, you know. And so there it is. Um, you have this, this whole thing, the gun guards. And most of the time, the gun guards that was over you, of course, was white, mm -hmm. you know and telling mm. you what to do and how to do it and so and that was the um field farmers what did y'all do but, what um, did you do with your force in, like what did you do with your money in prison i'm curious um and so you can you you have canteen um where you can go to the store buy different things um or buy clothes um at that time you can order clothes from places like JC Penney's and things like that. Wow. But it had to be blue it had to be blue jeans. Okay. It had to be blue chamber shirts or uh, a white t shirts and white underwear. And so they had um a system with that. But um but sooner or later they, they figured out how they can gain from that. They shut the, the ordering down and start selling that in the canteen, you know, at at a normal prices, you know, and so wait, 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 wait. there it is. Ronnie, you making four cents, but they charging you five dollars. Right. And so a lot of people, um, a lot of people will get money from home. You okay. Know, family would send them money, okay. money orders. You know, the, you didn't depend on the four cents to sustain you or whatever, gotcha. you know. And and a lot of guys had different like trades or um different talents where they can paint or make pocketbooks uh um any type of leather work and some jewelry and they they were in the hobby shop they had hobby shops and they could sell the items you know i know i know a brother who had um put his child through college from school from um from prison wait you know hold on yeah right there how, how so, was that so he in the jail he got a hobby mm -hmm. he's painting he could turn around mm -hmm. and sell that paint to only inmates right. or he could sell it outside no, as well outside of it you know family take it home raffle it off or sell it uh, um man you could sell it to security there that that works there um and and so yes and also um every year um twice a year um in angola they has a they have a rodeo there's an angola rodeo 
where the, where the public can come in. And there's an arts and craft area where um, guys set up and sell their things to people who come in from the rodeo. And of course, the prison gets a um, a percentage from that their sales when they're selling on um, rodeo. And so, <laughs> yo, so y'all really didn't have. There was no freedom. It was like whatever y'all do, we're going to benefit from it because y'all in here. We oh, yeah. own you. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, the phone calls there, um, numbers, <laughs> you know, everything. Um, it it just was a big. It was a big business, and um. Mm. Man, I've always wondered that. I've always wondered like how they survive financially. Mm -hmm. And but it is it's good to hear that you can make money on the outside mm -hmm. inside of prison. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so grateful that you were surrounded by the right the right men right. who helped you out. But wait right. a minute. You're sitting here talking to me right now. Mm -hmm. You said that you got life. Right. Tell us how did you get on parole? And so here it is, um, man, um, man, God really began to do some things in my life, began to change me from the inside out. I, I end up on, um, there was a Bible college established there, mm. um, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, where you can earn up to a bachelor's degree. Okay. You know? And, and, um, 2000, in 1999, I enrolled in, um, Bible college and, 2005, I received a bachelor's degree with, in Christian ministry. Wow. And, and um, a very awesome moment in my life, very defining moment in my life. Because um, I, was, I was so used to starting things but never finishing it. And this kind of broke that, that cycle, you know. And, and so here it is. Um, I have a bachelor's degree. And, and when you're finished, um, you're able to to have a job as an inmate minister. Your job is to go around in different areas that you're assigned to and just minister to people and just help, just, just listen to them a lot of times, you know. And, um, man, it, it got to a point where um, all the, the ministers were stacking up on each other on the 18,000 acres. They was producing this, a lot of ministers. And to the warden came up with this, I believe it was a God idea to send out missionaries to other prisons. Wow. And so after graduation, you can, you can go out as a missionary um, to another prison for at least two years and come back if you want, or you can stay there. And you go there and assist chaplains and also pastor churches. And so um, I actually went on a missionary journey. Yeah, this, this is insane. Um, but um, in the midst of all what was going on, the negativity of being in prison, the um, slavery, the, um, the modern day slavery, man, God was still in the midst doing some things. Mm. You know, he still was moving. He still was building his army behind the wire. And so, um, man, I went there and um, assisted the chaplain and pastor the church for like three and a half years. Um, um, amazing journey there. Then I ended up back in Angola, but um, in 2012, I, I never forget. Before I I left um the um the prison where I went on a missionary journey for a man. I believe God led me to do a a, a um a prep meeting um because there was a lot of guys who was stuck, who was barred out of court, um that couldn't get back in the court for for some type of reason and, you know, and a lot of great guys who God was changing, but they were stuck concerning the law. Mm. And um, I put out a fly up, you know, asking people to come to this prayer meeting that we was gonna pray concerning freedom. Um, look, you could bring, bring all your paperwork, bring your bring your um, transcript, we're gonna put it on the altar, <laughs> bring, bring your rap sheets, you know, um, that they that they they have a judge greater than a judge <laughs> <laughs> that that we meant to you know that's greater you know let let's bring it before God and man, man amazingly we did that oh man I'm talking about man the presence of God came in that because it it took a lot of faith yeah for a guy to dig up his legal work yeah and pass the law library up and bring it to church and put it on the altar wow. <laughs> that said something. 
And man, God honor that, man, his presence came in there. And before you know, a lot of people went to going home, you know. And of course, that was like 2000, 2009 when that happened. Um, it don't happen for me to 2012, you know. 2012, the United States Supreme Court came down with a ruling in Miller versus Alabama that said it was unconstitutional to give a juvenile a mandatory life sentence that they should have some type of meaningful opportunity for freedom, that a juvenile is more likely to be rehabilitated than an adult because the frontal lobe of their brain is not fully developed. And that's the part of the brain that helps you appreciate risk and consequences. And so that's why juveniles just do some some asinine things, you know. <laughs> and um look at God. And so yeah, look at God. And so it, it, it talked about the contradictory of how um uh a juvenile was not able to go into the liquor store and purchase liquor. But they go but they can go into the penitentiary. I never forget when I got to Angola, I saw a sign on the wall by the canteen that you couldn't that you could not buy cigarettes under the age of 21. Picture that. And so here it is. I'm in prison. I can't buy a cigarette because I'm too young. But I'm in it. But I could be in a penitentiary. <laughs> you know. So how did you fight and that? So, so when that law came out, did you hire an attorney or how did you how did you do so, it? And so um when that law comes out, that deems my sentence unconstitutional and um illegal so it's a violation um of my eighth amendment which was cruel and unusual punishment so i had to file into the courts a high lawyer filed into courts to correct an illegal sentence mm. and man here it is man i'm back in court um it's 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 amazing surreal moment um because i always felt Believe it or not, I always felt that I wasn't gonna die in Angola. Yeah, I, there was always this hope in me, and there, there were, there were moments, there were moments of unbelief that tried to attach itself to me. But man, I fought that by always going in the presence of God. I had developed a habit of man when I'm feeling some type of weird. Look here, I'm going to pray. I got to get in His presence, man. I gotta, I gotta go see Him, you know, and um. <laughs> And man, um, that amazing ruler comes down. I'm going back and forth to court. I never forget. I get to court, and my my lawyers is kind of my lawyer was kind of distraught. He was like, "Man, um, one of the victim's family didn't show up." And man, and and at at that time, and even now, victims, um, families they they carry some weight. Yeah, yeah. a lot of weight to whether you go home or not. Yeah. And so yeah. you can experience some opposition and you don't go home. And so he was like, man, um, and I noticed when I got in the courtroom, there was this lady on the front row on the other side that just kept watching me. She was staring at me. You know, I had on handcuffs and shackles. And so I'm looking and I don't want, I, I know I look already intimidated with all this on me, this jewelry on me. <laughs> and so, um, so I, I stopped looking at her, but out my peripheral, I see she still was staring. I'm like, man, I know she looks familiar. Couldn't think about it. And so when the lawyer came talking about, it, he said, man, one of the guy's sister came, you know, who the victim family is his sister, you know. And I was like, man, no, that's not his sister. I said, that's his mother. And so I remembered her. Look, out of all the people in the courtroom, um, I. I can't remember their faces, but her face burned in my mind. Wow. The guy who I killed, mother. I can still see her on the stand right now crying. I still see her face right now. And when God began to mature me and I developed a prayer life, I prayed, I prayed for this lady more than anybody. And so at the top of my list of desires, um, uh, was to meet her and just ask this just, just apologize to her mm. you know ask that she can forgive me for what i did to her her family and her son and um always desire that that was that was bigger than me going home yeah you know 
that was way greater than me going home. And so I saw an opportunity. I was like, man, look, um, told my lawyer, look, I want you to go find out if I can have a dialogue with it. I can talk to her. So he goes over there, talks to the DA, her. He comes back, says she don't want to talk. When she talks, she's going to talk on the stand. That's when she's going to talk. Just so happened, the court date is set back to the following month. That gave me more time to pray. Yeah. yeah. So um, when we go back to um, when we go back to court for this hearing, um, she requests that she talk to me. Wow. Tell you nothing but God. It's, it's just a series of mir- miracles in my life. Wow. You know, um, one on one after another. And so um, we talk. They bring her behind me. I'm handcuffed and shackled, and I'm, I have to turn around. She on the bench behind me, and I'm talking to her. And when I turn around and look at her, this is the most difficult conversation I have ever had in my life. Mm. Mm. And so I'm looking at this woman. Um, she's staring at me. I'm looking at her eyes, and I took her son from mm. her. And so... She her her arms were folded, and she just looking at me. And I broke the silence. I said, "Ma'am, I said I take full responsibility for the death of your son." When I said that, she took a deep breath and she exhaled her arms. She unfolded her arms and she leaned toward me. And and I said, "I have absolutely no excuse." I said I was um I said I was very young, I was very impressionable, um, I said very idiotic. Um I said, man, it's the um most foolish decision I ever made in my life. You know, and I said I just ask that somehow you can find in your heart to forgive me for what I did to you, to you and your family. And she responded. She responded. She said, um, "She said, you know, I don't, I don't hate you." And this is a very emotional um, conversation we having. I'm crying at the time of this conversation. She's crying, and and she said, "I don't hate you." And she said, "She said, I forgive you." Mm. And she said, I, "And she said this. She said, I believe you deserve a second chance." And man, um, she also began to tell me some other things about our son. She said, um, when our son died, uh, she didn't know that he had a son. And she found out he had a son. She said, and I raised him. She said, I wanted him to bring, I wanted to bring him to meet you today too. But, um, cause he forgives you, mm. you know, I was like, wow. And I told her this, I said, ma'am, um, I said, well, if I get out of here and I would love to meet him. And this was her response. She said, not if you get out, when you get out. Wow. And so everything about this experience and her, her character and her response told me that she had a relationship with God. You can't, you can't just do that. That was supernatural, you know? And, um, man, amazingly come back, um, finally, um, and rule and gave me parole eligibility and everybody clapping. And, you know, I, I never forget everybody was going out the, out the court room and I was the last case there. And, um, my little niece was the last one going through the door and the judge said, Mr. Olivier, um, he said, you can visit with your family a while. And so I told him to come on back and everybody was coming back. My family coming back and amazingly, the lady pushed past my family to get to me first. Mm. Mm. I'm talking about mind blowing mm. and, and told me she was happy for me. She said, man, just promise me one thing. I said, anything. He said, man, don't go back. Don't go back out there and pick up that gun. I said, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's done. Yeah. You know, and, um, just amazing moment in my life, man. Oh, mm. Man, when she said, I forgive you, even though I was handcuffed and shackled, man, I felt that come off of me. Mm. 
it really didn't matter how the proceedings went after that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. this was like, man, I was like, wow, you know. And I was expecting her, you know, I wouldn't mind if she would have said she hated me. I understood that. I was prepared for that. Hey, you know, man, I took this lady's son. You know, that's that's no small thing. Yeah. But to I'm, get forgiveness, man. It's real. And I'm I'm sitting over here trying yeah. to hold back my tears so we could finish this, um mm -hmm. so we could finish this interview. But it's just mm -hmm. amazing how good God can be, even in the midst of a yeah. dumb decision that what we can what we can do. You know, I I yeah. Yeah. I join you in praying for her family as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Praying for her son's son who she's had to raise yeah. and can only imagine the questions that he may have had growing up. Um, right. And and I pray that if he's watching this, he he learns more about you and your heart. Um, yeah. And and one day you'll have to have that conversation with your son of yeah. some of the exactly. The, the foolish decisions that you did at a young age and why you're mm -hmm. so involved in his life. And, and, and now that you're out, yeah. I, I, I really wanted to, to end the show with, with this. It's you're out. You served 27 years in prison. Yeah. Yeah. Um, unfortunately you, you, you took someone, some, someone else's life. Um, and now you're you're married to an amazing woman. Yes. You're you you have a, a beautiful son that's raising up. How hard was it to come out of twenty seven years of being told what to do, how to live, watching over your back? Uh, you made a statement earlier. That you said, "Hey, I'm going to come out as a man, either in the box mm -hmm. or walking out." But you came out as a man. Um. I, I want to. I, I think a lot of us watching this right now will be a little emotional. I want to talk about something happy. I mean, you, you found a woman. You you found a. You know what I'm saying. You found the love of your life. Tell us a little bit about this. How did y'all meet, bro? I mean, because if and I'm so, not mistaken, when I look so, at the math, you got out and you got married well, in the see, same year. No, the following year. I got out in November the 30th, 2018. Okay. okay. And April the ne the following year. Um. I got married, wow. so it wasn't too much alone, yeah. And so, um, this 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 lady, um, really found me. Um, three <laughs> years prior to me getting out, she was visiting me. I, I met her. Hold I'm on, that. Ronnie, hold on, bro. Hold on, Ronnie. Man, hold listen, on, hold on. ain't nothing we but talk God, about this, man. Ronnie. How was it that you could be in prison and a woman come hey. find you? I'm still single oh. and I'm not in jail. <laughs> hey, bro. Hey, nothing but God. I'm telling you, it's a series of miracles. Well, I'm hey, Ronnie, I love real... God, too. I got my Bible right <laughs> here, Ronnie. I'm still <laughs> single, bro. <laughs> Ronnie, I'm how did you. you meet this amazing woman, bro? Look, um, listen, how did the, you meet her, bro? Like, most... how, how did she find you? What, look, was it online? Look. Was it on the app? Like, what was you it, got, bro? You got to read the book, man. <laughs> one of the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful love stories ever told is in here. I'm telling you, only God, don't tell me what God can't do. We're going to get you. that book, Ronnie. Y'all, the link of his book is going to be inside the show description because it's not just the love story that's in there, but it's also yeah. just the, the story, too, that honestly will impact yeah. everyone's life everyone's life. So we're going to put 27 yeah. Summers link in the show description. Um, he's a part of an amazing publishing company who I just genuinely and truly love. Um, um, they've taken good care of me. They're taking good care of him. Uh, but we're definitely going to get that. But Ronnie, I just got to ask though, man, how do people in prison meet people outside of prison? How is that even possible? Um, it's um, one thing, um, a place what we was exposed to in prison was what I told you about the Angola rodeo. Yeah. So we could go out. And so you see a lot of people. And so actually a friend of mine had met her cousin, you know, and, um, met, and amazingly he had his story. Amazing too. He had, he was charged with first degree murder and got found guilty of first degree murder to him, but they get the death penalty and he's home. Now he's married to her cousin. They got married while he was in prison. Hold on, bro. And so, yeah, this so, was your so, cousin? Yeah, this is your this, cousin this, or your homeboy? I, this is my, my friend. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, 
is my homeboy, his wife, his wife's cousin. Bro, so, so, yo, hey man, I got one. I got a cousin for you. <laughs> yeah, he hooked me up. So, so it's it's a beautiful story. But um, man, and so for three years we just spent time getting to know one another. It built a, a beautiful foundation of friendship. We were just real good friends, and I think that's what um, that's what a lot of relationships are, are missing. You know, it get it get kind of blurred and confused with sex and, and this and that, you know? And so I'm not able to do none of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. All I can do is get to know someone. Yeah. And they get to know me. Yeah. And so that, that laid a beautiful foundation for our relationship. Um, in April of next year, it'll make five years that we've been married. Oh man. It's man. One of the best decisions I have ever made. Yeah. You know, I'm married way up. I'm way in over my head. You know, God, listen, God really blessed me. You know. <laughs> Yo, the way you smiling right now, like, bro, I don't yeah, understand, he, bro. I was yeah, a friend for 27 he, years. He I really, got out and got me one quick. She was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, man, she, and so she, when I discharged in um, November 30th, 2018, she was at the gate waiting on me. No, She was bro. at the front gate. I got, oh, I got videos of it and everything. Oh, man. Amazing moment there. And, man, been doing great. Oh, man. She, I'm happy for she's you. She's one of them. Yeah. For her yeah. to see yeah. the God in you while behind mm -hmm. prison, I don't know how many sisters well i don't want to be rude I, I don't know too many right. ladies i don't know if she's a sister or not mm -hmm. uh but i don't know too many ladies who will be like yo right. you know what i'm saying I, i'm mm -hmm. gonna give you a shot i'm gonna give you a chance right you know right. because i mean i'm pretty sure a lot of thoughts are going through their head but mm -hmm. but I, I'm, I'm 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 loving it so yeah and one of the one of the things when i came on wondering if how our family is going to receive yes that's what i was thinking too uh, Listen, listen, my in law, some of the best in love, never had any problem with me. Love me to death. It's just, I'm telling you, another miracle. Man, listen. You know? Man, listen. You my know, greatest if you can support find love team. And one, I'm about to find me some love. I'm about to find <laughs> me some love, man. You, you, you done made me feel better about my situation, man. If, if, if Ronnie can find some love, I'm going to find Come on, man. Anybody could. Man, listen, anybody could, man. I'm about to find it, man. So, what are you doing now, bro? What What are you doing now? You're and out so, of prison. You got a beautiful family. You know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I know that you're traveling around the world, sharing your message. But yeah. how yeah. is it? Because you know, one of the biggest problems that we see with people mm -hmm. transitioning from inside the prison to outside right. is hard for them to secure jobs, to to secure income. Right. What right. What are you doing to provide for your family yeah. now? Yeah. Amazingly, man, um, I've been home five years, just made five years in November, um, and I have never been without a job. I I have all, from the gate, from the day I left out the gate, I had a job and never been without work. Even through the pandemic, when people was being laid off, laid off I had, man, just amazing. I'm telling you, miracle after miracle. And, um, Got a call in the middle of the pandemic. Um, I was already working on a job, and um, from um the former warden, who was over in Gola, he calls me. He's he's now the um the commissioner over the Mississippi Departments of Corrections. He's over all the prisons in Mississippi, and he calls me to to be the head chaplain at Mississippi State Penitentiary. And parchment look, I'm telling you, I came I couldn't make this stuff up. <laughs> I'm telling you, this this is a series of miracles. And so um parchment is likened to in gold. It's eighteen thousand acres again. It, this is the 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 penitentiary. And I'm like, man, here it is. I'm going back into prison. <laughs> but <laughs> But um, believe me, I, I knew it was God because prior to that, I was just telling my wife because I was the um, at that time, I was working as the supervisor over the um natural gas of the town of Simsport. Okay, which is a miracle how I got that job. So, and um, and I was telling her, you know, I, I'm very grateful, um, 
or the job, grateful, man, that I can help and provide for my family through this. I said, but God ain't called me to be the gas man. Yeah. I got a great desire to be in full-time ministry. The next week I get the call from him. Wow. The next week. Wow. Wow. And so, and so we made a decision, her and I, and we moved to Mississippi. You moved and your whole family to Mississippi. Moved my whole family to Mississippi. And we stayed there for like three and a half years, for about four years. We just we just um made a transition in April from there to Baton Rouge. Um, bought a home, bought my first home. Real man, listen, man, I'm telling you, real great neighborhood um, that I could raise my son in. Yeah, where he'll never see the things that I saw. Come on, man. He'll never, he'll never, he would never go to prison. Yeah. I guarantee you, he'll never go to prison. Yeah. And so, um, man, um, and and so now I work for the Louisiana Parole Project. Wow. Now, when I discharge from prison, this this program um, helped me to make a transition from prison to home. Okay. You know, and that's what that's what we do. We we provide wraparound services that that help guys make a transition, especially guys who've been in prison at least. 20 years we helped them make a transition because a lot has changed you yeah. know cell phones you yeah. know we have tech we have tech classes you know we have scam classes because they're you know they're susceptible to scams now you know they don't know anything about that um and so many things we 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 just we just help them with man yeah. um we help them get jobs we make sure when they come home they get all all their benefits, you know, um, Medicaid, Medicare, whatever, what have you. Make sure they get licensed and and just help them get a great start. Yeah, you know. And so we a little bit over what <clears throat> just made it a little bit over five hundred since we've been in um since we've been in operation since twenty sixteen, and we we a little bit over five hundred clients, and we have a less than two percent recidivism rate. So that that, which, that which, means that they go back into the prison, right? Less than two percent wow. recidivism. So that that translates in Lamb's terms that if you come through our program from prison, you're more than likely never to return back in prison. Wow! Because they get great starts. Yeah, you know, we help them get everything they need. We we give them housing when they come home. They get they get housing, clothing, food. They don't have to worry about anything for the first month that they're home. Wow. Nothing at all. Nothing. And so we take care of that. Just help them make a great transition. And and it's it's awesome, man. That provide, and that 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 um that requires me part of my job of going back into prison. I go back and I just was in Angola the other day and and I interview guys for our program, you know. And, and seeing who's ready, you know, and so, and just just giving back, man, just helping them, brothers, man. No, man, <clears throat> Ronnie, I think that your story is amazing, and I mm -hmm. think that we definitely can't go through everything that's in the book, Twenty Seven Summers. Um, and so, you guys, for those of you watching it right now, uh, this is definitely a God story that I believe can happen for anybody. It's not just special to Ronnie. I believe if you believe in God, that's right. At the end of the day, God still got to get the glory out of your yeah. life, no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through. And a lot of us are saying, hey, you know, I've never been close to going to jail, but I may be going through hell. And no matter what mm -hmm. hell you're going through right now, as we can see from Ronnie's story and journey of life, God can flip that thing around. You may have been going through hell. You may be drowning in debt right now. You may have lost your job. You may have lost your business. Your child may be going astray a little bit. At the end of the day, if you seek ye first the kingdom of God, if you put him the yes, head sir. of your life, God has to get the glory. Now, you may be thinking, yes, it's been 10 years. He was in jail for 27. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's been going on for too long. Listen. It's not about our timing. It's about God's timing. And while we're That's going right. through the process, how are we evolving? How are we growing? How are we maturing 
And how are we still giving God the glory? And I don't want to preach too much because I'm going to preach at the end of it. But how do you really, you really want to upset the devil? When you're going through hell, acknowledge the hell mm. you're going through, but still give God the glory while you're going through hell. Yes, sir. Yes, that will sir. Upset, yes, sir. That will upset the enemy, but it will activate the kingdom. And so even for man. me, man, my team don't even know some of the hell that I'd be going through because I still come down man. and I still give God the glory. I still push through. I still do my job. But that's upsetting the enemy because the enemy thought right. he the enemy thought he had Ronnie. The enemy thought, oh, he yeah. gonna die in jail. The enemy thought he was just gonna be raped and just killed and destroyed in the prison. But God said, not my child. That's not right. my child. So so brother Anderson, look, let me interject this here, man. Yeah. I, Right now in my life, I enjoy, and I'm talking about every moment in my life, mm. every day moment, man. But that didn't start when I got out of prison. Mm. I was enjoying everyday life while I was in prison. Mm. So it doesn't make no difference of your geographical location or what your situation is. What makes the difference is him being in me, mm. allowing him to, to work in me outward these things you know and having an inward peace and joy you know that that that's not circumstantial yeah you know yeah and yeah. so and so it's 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 an innate ability to, to to withstand all that and trust god in the midst of it and let him walk you through all that i'm telling you man um i've had some of the best times with him in prison in a cell <laughs> I'm talking about, look, I'll be in a one man cell. I remember I, they put me in a cell for 18 months, 23 hours a day. You only get an hour outside the cell. An hour outside the cell. That's once a day. And I was there for 18 months. Now, why is this here? <clears throat> but why is this? There was another man in the cell. Mm. <laughs> I'm telling you, the presence of the presence of God will fill that cell, and a lot of people thought I was losing my mind. Who was on that tier in other cells? You know, I go to clapping and just man being. Re I'm talking about really rejoicing yeah. and thanking God yeah. in the midst of that because he he had come in there. I know I wasn't alone. Yeah, he was there with me. And matter and man, no matter where you at in your life, man. You're not alone. Yeah. He's there. He's waiting on you. <laughs> He's waiting to embrace you, to love you, past where you are. Yeah. And man, I can remember, man, I he would give me prophetic glimpse of um where I was going. I remember one time I got so happy, I was loud. I saw myself in New York. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm in prison. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I got a life sentence. Yeah. But I saw myself in New York in, in about, what, probably about a week or two later, guess who ended up by myself? Jim Simbler mm. from New York. Mm. He come visit me. Man, I'm telling you, man, I couldn't make this stuff up. And so, man, I learned to enjoy everyday life in the midst of all the turmoil. Yeah. Because once I found purpose, Yeah. you know, I found purpose in him, and I was I, I started helping people while I was in prison. Yeah, from where I was, you know, and there was and this was during a time when there was absolutely no light at the end of the tunnel. But brother Anthony, there was a light in the tunnel. <laughs> there was a light in the tunnel, and that's what I embraced. I embraced that light, and he led me to the end of that tunnel. And that's why I'm sitting here today. Don't tell me what God can't do, man. Nah. After hearing your story, it personally convicted me. I'm I'm just being honest. You know, it's it's I I need to stop complaining. After hearing your story, we all go through things, but to see you this energetic, to see you this happy, to see you married, to see you have a child, to see you impacting lives, I am personally convicted because I've complained about things that you probably would have found joy in. <laughs> I've complained, we've all complained about things that probably Ronnie would have been like, man, y'all crazy, what? <laughs> let, let, me, let me show you what you really should be complaining about. And man, I, I just wanna say thank you for coming on the show today to inspire us 
to inspire the world. We're going to get your book. I already yeah. have my copy of the book, but I want to encourage everyone uh, to uh, to get your copy, to get your copy of this man's book. Um, um, Michelle is in the room. We're going to make this a book of the month, uh, the book the book of the month um, uh, for February or Great. March. Yeah. We'll figure that out. Uh, but we want to make this the book that we, we read as an E3 community. Um, and I just want to say thank you. So we're going to drop it in the show description. Yes, you guys sir. go support it. This man needs to become a New York Times bestselling author. Let's see what else. Let's let's help God get this story out because it's, it's needed. And so, y'all, thank you uh, so much. Ronnie man, yes, um, and we're gonna link all of Ronnie's information, his Instagram, so you can go see him and his beautiful family. We'll link his website and all information. Gonna learn more about him, and 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 to other podcasters who are watching and listening. Hey, get him on your show. Let's 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 expose this message to other platforms because, man, I, I knew it was gonna be a good conversation, but I didn't know it was gonna be this good and convicting, and so. Um, I am extremely grateful for you, Ronnie, and I wish we had more time on the show, yeah. uh, but you've blessed me tremendously, and I'm going to make sure I do my part to tell my friends about your story, to get you on other shows, to get you on other platforms. And, man, if I could ever come out to those prisons or to come out to your organization to talk to these young people, to teach them how to budget, personal finance, uh, walk into those prisons and just be a light um, there, let me know. I'm coming. I'll fly yes, myself sir. to Mississippi. Um, I'll fly myself to Baton Rouge, where you are right now. Man, I would love to meet yes, you sir. in person and uh, partner with you yeah. to continue your message, Definitely. man. Definitely, man. Definitely, man. Appreciate yes, you. Sir. Y'all, listen, go check him out. As you all uh, know, it's been a great time. We'll see you on the next show. Peace out.